great. So, yeah, th thanks so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really, real, real honor to be here talking to you all today. And really, I'm just going to um, present something which is, it's, it's a newish thing for me. Um, and this suggestion of going towards a democratic approach to health concepts. So it's not like something I have a really well formed argument about or a uh, paper written or anything like that. It's really just an idea I want to put out there and test and see what what you'll think and you know get your feedback and suggestions and stuff like that. And the idea is a very simple one. Um, and that's that instead of trying to construct a theory of health, which can tell us the boundaries between health and pathology, that instead we should just approach health as something democratic that we can all have a say in to varying extents on various ways to determine the boundaries of what counts as healthy or not. Um, so that's what I'm going to try and motivate. Um, okay, so overview. Um, so I've, I'm, I'm trying to make this um, uh, accessible to non-specialists. Non so I'm going to explain what all these terms mean and stuff and, and not be too technical. Um, but I'll begin by just saying about the problem of health, of defining health and why I'm interested in it and why it's important to think about. I'll then go on to like the main debate in philosophy of medicine, which is the naturalist normativist debate. And this is like the two main camps for defining you know, health basically, or thinking about the nature of health. And I'll explain what both of those terms mean and say why I'm unhappy with both camps um, or I'm unsatisfied anyway, I'm, I'm not unhappy with them. Um, and then going to propose a, a preliminary synthesis, which is a bit more on the normativist side. Um, and then once I've done that, I'm going to just make the, the general point that or suggestion of shifting away from trying to produce a theory of health, which tells us exactly what health is or should be, and instead to towards the democratic approach. And when I say democratic approach, I mean precisely an approach where people can people can ultimately um, vote and and decide on what should count as as healthy or pathological. Um, I'll then consider three problems. I'm sure there are loads more, but these are three which uh, occurred to me, which also will help me and and will help me clarify my reasoning in, in a bit more detail. Um, and and say some reasons I think this approach would be helpful. Um, just to say as well, I'm going to like all these terms are really contested: illness, disease, disorder, uh, pathology. I'm going to use the term pathology here, but you could you could use one of those other terms if you want. Um, no one can agree on exactly what any of these means. I mean, that's part of the point of this talk. Um, but yeah, so I'm just going to stick with pathology um, just for the sake of this talk. I'm not particularly dedicated to it. I mean, I you know could could use the other terms. Um, and the second thing, just to say as a as a caveat, is I'm going to speak mainly about mental health, um, but I really mean you know the, the proposal is about about bodily health or somatic health as much as mental health the reason i'm focusing on mental health is just because that's something i'm more familiar with and, and know more about basically so so that's the only reason why um but we can talk afterwards about how you know how how widespread the, um this suggestion could be and, and how, how much utility it has okay so um Two related questions, the problem with health. Um, there's two related issues or questions which I'm concerned with. I'm going to kind of pick them apart later, um, but I think they're fairly closely related. And the first one regards the metaphysics of health, right? So these are questions like what is health or pathology or what kind of thing is health and pathology? Are they social constructs? Are they natural kinds? Are they whatever else? Um, so that's one question, it's about the nature of health. And the second question is about the boundaries of health, right? Where should we locate the boundaries between health and pathology, um, and especially in concrete cases as well, but also in a more general sense? What rules could we adopt which would lead us to think one thing is healthy and one thing isn't? Um, and these are two related questions because, you know, what you think health actually is will probably give you some idea 
of where you think the boundaries should be. So often people who are concerned with the boundaries begin by answering the first question, what health is. And then from that, they often try to develop a theory of health. And that theory of health, they try to make it so it will help us determine the boundaries. Um, and then you get people who critique that and they say, well, here's a counterexample um, where your theory of health would end up pathologizing something we don't want to pathologize, like tattoos or something, um, or, or, or so forth, right? So counterexamples. Um, so these questions are generally taken to be interrelated, although later I'm going to try to pull them apart a little bit and say, and say that they're, we have more space for the second, um, depending on which metaphysics we adopt. And I'm interested in this, and I think lots of other people become interested in this as well, um, for given two related worries. And these are what I'm going to call wrongful pathologization and wrongful depathologization. So what I mean by wrongful pathologization is when we medicalize and pathologize something, which it turns out to have been really harmful to have pathologized, right? So one of the key historical examples, and there are a great many, is the pathologization of queerness. When there was a mental disorder called homosexuality and people were diagnosed with this and attempts to treat them and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's you know, uh, widely accepted now that this was, it, this was a terrible error. Um, it, wasn't just a, it wasn't just an error, but it was really harmful. It hurt lots of people, right? It's harmful to pathologize ways of being or, or certain ways of functioning and so forth, which, which, we, which um, aren't inherently um, pathological in some sense. Um, and there's also many contemporary examples as well, right? So to give some contemporary examples, lots of autistic people argue that autism is wrongly pathologized. Um, lots of people adopt fat as, a, as an identity and say that, you know, obesity as a clinical term is a, is a kind of wrongful pathologization. And there are countless other examples, often relating to mental health, but also, um, also somatic health. Um, so you want a theory of health that helps you determine the boundaries that doesn't wrongfully pathologize people, um, whatever that means. Um, and this is important because, I mean, the idea of wrongful pathologization often seems to presuppose that there is some kind of right level of pathologization, which again leads you back to the question of health. Um, and the second worry is what I call wrongful depathologization. Um, I'm taking this term from uh, Luthien Spencer, um, who with Harry Corral wrote this um, brilliant recent paper on OCD um, about how the OCD concept has often increasingly been kind of co-opted by people who don't have OCD in a way where it's turned into more of a quirk than a medical condition. Um, right, so you get lots of people who maybe just a bit uh, pedantic about tidying but don't have OCD and kind of go oh I'm so OCD and that kind of thing um, and they see that as a kind of wrongful depathologization because you have people who have OCD and for them it's a often anyway a highly debilitating uh, medical condition and then to have it kind of wrongly depathologized um, might trivialize it um, obviously that's not people's intention but it can trivialize it and so forth um, and we can also just fail to recognize things, right? So like chronic fatigue might be another example, often has been seen as, um, you know, just laziness or something like that. Um, but in fact, it's really important to recognize it, I think, as a, as a genuine condition, right? It really impacts people's lives and it's harmful to not recognize it. So really we want a theory of health, according to most accounts, that helps us determine the boundaries of health in ways that doesn't lead to wrongful pathologization on the one hand, and yet doesn't lead to wrongful depathologization on the other, right? So that's, I think, why probably most people are interested in this question. And I think it's a really good reason to be interested in this question. It's precisely why I'm interested in it. Okay. Um, so the big debate so far has been between the naturalists and the normativists. And um, I think this, this uh, old quote from uh, Ken Kendall sums it up pretty well. So in the philosophy of medicine, he says, the most fundamental issue and also the most contentious one is whether disease and illness are normative concepts based on value judgments or whether they are value-free scientific terms 
in other words, whether they are biomedical terms or socio-political ones. And basically the, the naturalists are on the, um, you know, the scientific value-free side and the normativists say they're more kind of socio-political terms, they're more value judgments. Um, put very simply, are terms like healthy, ill, pathological, and so forth, do these confer natural groupings or are the groupings socially determined? So I'll now say a little bit more about each side and why I'm not uh, content with the most positions from either. Although, I, as we'll see, I come down more on the norm to this side. Um, so naturalism. Um, all right, yeah, so I've written objectivism here because some people also call it objectivism. Um, but I'll, I'll just say naturalism for this talk. So the, the naturalist will claim that health and pathology are natural kinds in some sense, determined in relation either to evolutionary adaption, relate, relate, which is determined by um, our evolutionary history, or to fitness in the Darwinian sense. Um, I don't want to go into that distinction that much, but some people are more on the fitness side and some people more on the evolutionary adaption side. And what they, I mean, what they do is adopt a Darwinian framework in one way or another and say that um, once you adopt a Darwinian framework, you can work out what should count as healthy and what should count as pathological. Um, and then usually they'll say that health is synonymous with evolutionary functioning, while pathology is synonymous with evolutionary dysfunction, right? So we know, for instance, that the you know, a core function of the heart is to pump your blood around your body. Um, if it stops doing that, you get ill very quickly and then you die. Um, so if your heart stops doing that, then that's a dysfunction. It's, it's failed to fulfill the function for which it was designed or it's impeded your fitness levels, right? You can't survive and reproduce and so forth. Um, so the naturalist will, in one sense or another, say you can, you, for using this kind of model, you can determine exactly what should count as healthy or pathological. You need to work out the functions or the, the fitness conferring um, components of, of various mechanisms of, of the body and mind and of cognition and so forth. And then you basically assess the individual and how, that, well, how well their, their body parts or their, their mind or so forth is functioning in relation to a broader maybe statistical norm. Um, and then you can determine who is healthy and who isn't. And if you adopt this kind of approach, um, you end up, or people tend to end up saying that the boundaries between health and pathology is naturally determined. So as Christopher Boss has put it, for instance, uh, health is an objective matter to be read off the biological facts of nature without need of value judgments. So if you accept this approach, then you'll think that there's some way you can naturally determine what should count as healthy, what should count as ill. You, you can just do, if you do enough studies into autistic people or to any controversial case, um, you'll be able to find out whether we should, you know, be saying this is a case of health or, or a case of pathology. Um, so what are the core problems with this? Um, Something I'll just very briefly mention, but won't say anything about, um, is that once you get into the details, there are like loads of metaphysical problems. So even naturalists can't agree on one account because they've all got problems with each other's accounts. Um, but I'm not going to, I mean, I, I've written about that before, but I won't go into that now. Um, but what I will say is that there's huge room for different interpretations in pretty much all of the controversial cases, um, depending on which different assumptions people adopt in relation to things like evolutionary history um, or who we should measure people against, which kind of reference class we should use to determine fitness in relation to, and all kinds of things like that. And I think this is important here because given, given our concerns about wrongful pathologization and wrongful uh, depathologization, um, because it's not clear how much this helps, right? So just to give the example of, of autism, um, there's loads of literature on autism from kind of like evolutionary psychology perspectives, asking whether it's trying to either explain it as a dysfunction or as function, right? So this ranges all the way from people who say autism is some kind of uh, leftover from the reptilian brain, which hasn't updated properly, and they say it's a dysfunction, all the way to the other side where you get 
um, people who are saying, well, autism is some kind of, you know, autistic people evolved to make tools and spears and stuff like that, while all the neurotypicals were kind of talking with each other and socializing and stuff like that. Um, so they have a kind of functional account. Um, but this doesn't really help us determine anything because, you know, you've just got so many different stories and it's, it's harder to verify these and so forth. And, it, and that's even before you get to the underlying metaphysical problems with the different accounts. So I don't think it actually helps us determine the controversial cases. Um, the same kind of problems just re reappear. Secondly, a big worry that many people have with the naturalist accounts is that they might not naturalize the wrongful pathologization of marginalized groups. So a, an example of this people often bring up as a, as a worry is that if we just adopt a naturalist account of health, which uh, makes it synonymous with evolutionary functioning, then this might, for instance, uh, lead to the pathologization of queer people or asexual people as well, basically anyone with atypical um, um, uh, sexual orientation. Um, and that's because of the emphasis on reproduction and passing on your genes and stuff like that. Um, and you know, the, the thought is you're more likely to reproduce and pass on your genes and all that stuff if you're attracted to people you can reproduce with. Um, and so if you, would, if you would adopt this kind of perspective, that might lead to an account saying that there's something uh, like impeded fitness in the evolutionary sense um, with queer people. Which, so, so lots of critics of this account bring this up as a worry and say, if we adopt this account, that might lead to the pathologization of queer people. Um, and that's a reason to be, to be worried about this account. It doesn't seem to fit with what we actually want to say, um, it, you know, and, and what we think is right. And thirdly, um, in the other direction, um, if we did adopt this and, and, and actually follow it strictly, it might leave certain conditions unrecognized. So what if it turned out, for instance, and lots of people do think this, that anxiety is some kind of adaptive functional thing, um, even in cases where it actually can be really harmful. Um, now, if we therefore say, well, therefore, it's not a medical condition, that might leave this unrecognized when, in fact, lots of people want recognition uh, for anxiety so they can access psychotherapy or medication or things like that. So that's a potential worry um, with that, that as well. It could leave recognition, uh, certain conditions which it is helpful to recognize uh, unrecognized. So naturalism, um, there's worries about the wrongful depathologization on the one hand and wrongful pathologization on the other. Okay, so what about the other account, normativism? Uh, this is also sometimes called constructivism. So what does normativism say? Um, it says health and pathology are socially normative human concepts rather than being just naturally determined. And Cooper has a nice analogy with the concepts of weeds here, right? Um, so she says like, you know, you have plants and you have flowers, and these are, you know, plants is a natural kind. Um, but then we have this further concept, weeds. And weeds isn't a natural kind. It's a purely normative concept for kinds of plants that we dislike or disvalue and therefore want to control or eliminate for various reasons. Uh, hence, we have weed control and stuff like that. And the concept, concepts uh, like disease or illness or pathology are just human normative concepts like the concept of weeds. They reflect the values of a given society or perhaps groups or individuals even at a given time. And depending what we value or disvalue, um, certain mental states, certain bodily states or dispositions, uh, we put some of these in the pathology side and some of these in the health side. So weeds is a pure, purely normative concept, use of divide plants we like from those we don't. Um, and similarly, we refer to various bodily or mental states or dispositions or so forth we disvalue and want to treat or cure as pathology, illness or so forth. So that's what the constructivist says. So I think um, the constructivist, by the way, it is probably right by default unless a naturalist can come up with a convincing account, right? Um, so this is important. If naturalism fails, 
um, you kind of collapse into normativism by default. Um, and this is one of the reasons I tend to go towards normativism is because I don't think there is a um, convincing naturalist account which can map onto healthy pathology in a helpful and convincing way. And yet normativism runs into problems too. And in fact, quite similar problems to naturalism. And this is what makes me wary of just accepting this as it is. So just like naturalism, normativism can also pathologize minorities. It's just in this case, um, in this case, it's just determined by societal values, right? By whatever people happen to think. Um, so if in a homophobic society, people pathologize queerness, that becomes a pathology. Um, so it doesn't seem to be booby trapped against that in any obvious way. Um, so that worry kind of re-arises re with normativism. Similarly, if a society decides that, oh, dyslexia isn't a real thing we should recognize, it's just whatever, just, you know, um, as so it's something I hear lots of people say. Um, and, you know, that, that would lead to the misrecognition of things that it is helpful to recognize, right? Um, so it just kind of seems to rely too much on um, potentially bigotry or ignorance, right? Whatever society happens to think as a whole, um, whatever society claims is an illness, is an illness, and whatever it claims isn't, isn't. Um, so one way of understanding this worry is, is I, I call it the mob rule problem. Um, so normativism might seem to collapse into a kind of mob rule thing, which can potentially be helpful sometimes, but in other cases, it can be guided by bigotry, ignorance, and so forth. So normativism, um, people are often wary for, 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 for these reasons too. So normativism and naturalism, the two main approaches, I think, tend to lead to the precisely the same problems as each other. Okay, so I'm going to propose a different approach, which I hope can uh, at least minimize these problems. I don't think you can have a perfect theory of health, by the way. I just think it's a very messy kind of thing, um, but I think we can have better or worse ones. But before we get to that, I just want to say a bit about my understanding of this debate. Um, and a potential synthesis. And I'm going to come down a bit more on the normativist side, but I'm gonna to hope to try and get some naturalists on board too. And rather than ask, how should we think of health? I just want to say a bit about what I think we do call healthy or ill for a moment. And basically, I think that normativism is right, but evolutionary dysfunctions also make up a great many of the things we happen to disvalue. Right. So I think normativism is right, but also the evolutionary dysfunctions are prototypical cases of pathology. But importantly, I don't think we need to equate natural dysfunction with pathology. Uh, so health and illness are normative concepts, but it's also the case that prototypically illnesses will also be evolutionary dysfunctions. So for instance, heart failure is a prototypical pathology uh, or illness or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that doesn't mean it's the, that's the only way to think about illness. There are many things we call illnesses which might not be dysfunctions, which might just be harmful or disvalued for other reasons. And importantly too, if you accept this account, um, to say that evolutionary dysfunctions are prototypical cases of pathology doesn't mean claiming that they're more real illnesses than other kinds of illness. You know, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't commit to that at all. It just says that, that, that they're a prototypical case. So going forward, I'm going to adopt this approach. Um, we can talk about it more in the questions. I'm, I'm sure people who work on these things will, will have, have stuff to say about that. Um, but this is what I think probably is the case with how we do talk about health and illness. Um, in general. Okay, so just going to check my time. Good. So I now want to begin to make my my towards my suggestion uh, the democratic approach, 
And I just want to tease apart the metaphysical question about health, what is health, and the boundaries question. And as I said at the beginning, people tend to develop a metaphysics of health or theory of health to then help them determine the boundaries. And I can see why people do that. And I think that adopting a metaphysics precisely should inform us about how we might determine the boundaries. And yet, I don't think adopting a particular metaphysics, at least in, in every case, logically implies a specific boundary you have to adopt. And I think there's room to separate the metaphysics of health from deciding the boundaries of health, right? So I think we can commit to what I just suggested, a kind of normativism, which also includes a, uh, a, a naturalist element. Um, and we can commit to that metaphysics, but we don't have to commit to any specific um, boundaries or way of determining the boundaries. There might actually be some room for moving there. Um, and I'm going to make an analogy here um, with money or currency. And just to say, so I don't know if this is a good analogy. I came up with it a couple of days ago when I was preparing for this talk. So if anyone's got a better one, please, please let me know. But I want to propose this as an alternative to Cooper's weeds analogy. So remember Cooper says that, you know, pathology as a concept is a bit like the concept weeds. It just refers to the things that we don't like and want to control and want to exterminate or whatever. Importantly, with weeds, there's no, as far as, far as I know anyway, I, I'm not an expert on weeds, but I don't think there's any regulator that assesses what we count as weeds, right? As such, it's, it's not like a, it, there is some subjective differences, but it is very much societally determined in, in some sense, right? So when I grew up, people just told me what things counted as weeds, and I just accepted that. I didn't get, there's no regulator I went to, I didn't, I didn't learn it. It's, it's, it's just a kind of societally determined thing. Um, and this is a bit like the kind of mob rule thing, right? So there's a mob rule determining what counts as weeds or what counts as just ordinary plants or flowers. There's no independent regulator or anything like that. I want to suggest that we think of these concepts a bit more in the way we think of money or currency. Now, there's some similarities which are very important and some differences which are important. So when it comes to the similarities, like weeds, money and its value is socially rather than naturally determined. So, right, the, the only reason, uh, say, a pound is worth however many dollars or whatever um, is just because of how people feel and think about it, right? And that changes if we start feeling differently, right? So it's socially determined. Um, and this makes it, in that sense, very similar to weeds. Both of them have a social ontology. And yet there's very important difference. The difference is that we have a variety of, of mechanisms in place to intervene when prices fluctuate in harmful ways. We've got various regulators, there's national regulators, there's international ones, um, where, where uh, and also very importantly, we also have democratic institutions allowing us to elect people to make decisions about money that affect its value, right? So, I mean, like, uh, I, I mean, I just, I just saw Liz Truss has resigned, the prime minister earlier today, and, you know, and that's basically because she was just elected by her party, became prime minister, made some kind of ideological decisions and crashed the pound. And now there's democratic institutions have kind of kicked in and kicked her out. Well, well she's, you know, she's resigned, but, but you know, um, effectively, right? Um, so we've got various democratic institutions to intervene if, um, if stuff goes wrong here in various ways. Um, and I want to ask why we can't think of health more like this and approach it more like this. Um, because unlike weeds and much more like money, how we actually do set the boundaries for health does affect all of us in really important ways. I've already said that's what's motivating this question in the first place. And if that's the case, perhaps we should all get a say. Perhaps we should think of it much more like money. Perhaps we should have more democratic institutions, more regulators and so forth. 
So that's my suggestion. Why not a democratic approach to health instead? Um, we can adopt the normativist metaphysics, but then still, uh, still go towards a democratic approach rather than adopting just the kind of mob rule approach and, and the problems that come with that. Um, so if we begin by agreeing that it is normatively determined, there is no necessary implication that we should allow health status to be determined by uh, so-called mob rule. We could instead work towards increasing democratic mechanisms. And my aim today, to be clear, I'm not going to specify exactly what those mechanisms would be, only to suggest going in that direction and to try and motivate it and consider some potential issues. Although I will say there are a huge range of approaches to democratic theory and democratic representation, which would be relevant. Um, and I just don't have a well worked out view on that or strong views on which approach would work best. So if anyone has suggestions, by the way, that, that's really great, please, please let me know. Some benefits. Um, I think there would be some benefits for taking this approach. Firstly, I think it could be empowering. So often I think perhaps with, with health and how, you know, in, and again, I'm thinking in the controversial cases um, where, you know, queerness is pathologized or autism pathologized, um, fatness is pathologized and so forth, or, or wrongful pathologization. Um, often the problem is par partially about control, right? About having health boundaries determined on the one hand, perhaps either by elite doctors or scientists, or perhaps on the kind of by, by the mob rule, if you're on the norm to this side. Um, and the basic thought, and I think this is the most important benefit, is that it could empower people to determine their own health status in, right? So groups could lobby more and have more mechanisms for determining their own health status. Secondly, in particular, it would be practically helpful for determining controversial cases. Um, this relates to the first benefit. Uh, thirdly, I wonder if it can be epistemically useful. And what I mean by this is that I think there's often a idea, I think probably, I often encounter this among, you know, in day-to-day -day life, not just among experts or anything, but there's, a, there's an idea that health is just somehow determined by nature, which is, which is often implicit, a kind of naturalism. And I think actually just thinking about health as a democratic process, um, and you know, spreading that idea might help open up new ways of seeing and understanding health, the whole new possibilities of, of, of thinking about and approaching it. And so I think it might be epistemically useful. And finally, and this really relies on if you, if you think the first three actually are benefits, but if we begin this with health more, um, it would be perhaps a basis for understanding democracy elsewhere, for instance, into diagnostic classifications. So, or, or, or what we should call diagnoses, for example. So there's, to give a, an example, there's lots of controversy about the concept of borderline personality disorder. Lots of people think this is very harmful, for example, including lots of people with the diagnosis. Um, perhaps we could open up democracy there more, or, or, or and have more democratic mechanisms to help um, people who would be given that diagnosis decide what should it be called? Should it be called anything at all? Should there be a, should there be a diagnosis at all and so forth? Not just whether it should be counted as uh, pathological. Okay. Um, so, what time is it? Okay, I'm just gonna talk about some objections. Um, in the last 10 minutes. So problem one, what I call the anti-democratic urge. And this is something I, I've encountered a lot and kind of what, what got me thinking about this actually. Uh, so the, the image on the right here is the controversial diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, which contains you know, all the mental disorders. And controversially, the DSM committee votes on what to include as mental disorders. And lots of people uh, are really angry about this, right? Um, and something interesting that happens is um, lots of like best-selling books appear, or at least you know, 
well-selling books um, almost every year or two at the moment. And they, they kind of say that we're, we're revealing the shocking truth that mental disorders are determined by consensus rather than scientific discovery. And then, you know, people get very angry about this. Um, I think there's something right about this, this anger. Um, I'm gonna say more about that in a minute, but I want to also critique this view actually slightly. Um, so the narrative that there's something wrong, uh, just in the fact that it's determined by consensus rather than scientific discovery, seems to me to, to at least implicitly commit to some quite naive form of naturalism, right? And the idea that we can just, you know, discover what should count as a disease by looking at it in a lab or something like that, right? Um, but that's not how any disease classification is, is, um, is, is actually made. In fact, we already have some level of democracy. We already have some level of consensus, which makes these, like interpretations never just emerge out of nowhere. Um, there has to be some discussion. Um, so importantly, and this is really important, our health concepts and our concepts relating to, relating to in medicine are already determined by consensus to some extent, not just in psychiatry, um, right? So there are consensus conferences for everything in general medicine and all the, spe all the, all the specialties, all the specializations. Um, and, you know, you have the international committees who just determine, you know, what exactly counts as a virus and things like that. So it's, it's the same across the board. Um, and just, just to note as well, um, this actually mirrors how boundaries are determined in other sciences, right? So and, and a nice example is in 2006, um, people with relevant expertise voted on whether Pluto should still be counted as a planet, and they voted that it shouldn't be, right? So it was, it was demoted to being a dwarf planet in 2006. Although that debate is still ongoing despite that vote, and now some people are arguing that it should be classified as a planet again. So boundaries in sciences are determined by consensus in an important sense anyway. Um, so I, I think we should resist thinking it's actually, it's terrible that people, you know, pe that consensus um, determines these things. That in itself isn't a problem. My claim is that the problem with the DSM is not that it relies on democracy, but rather that it's only a very partial democracy. Um, and as some, something lots of critics have, have pointed out with the, the DSM, it's a relatively homogenous group. So mainly middle class, cishet, white guys from the US, um, who are not very representative necessarily of, of all sorts of views. So the problem for me is not that it's decided by consensus, but it, that it's such a partial democracy, it's not representative. Um, so my proposal would be, instead of taking the anti-democratic approach and following that urge and saying, ah, it's, it's so bad that it's determined by consensus, rather we should go completely the opposite direction, right? To say actually the democracy should be radically expanded, giving much more power to marginalized groups, in particular those who are affected by these classifications, right? So as I've said, people classified with any of the, the mental disorder classifications um, or, or who might be. And to do this, we come back to the point, which would be to develop mechanisms for centering marginalized groups to determine their own health status, um, which would be the democratic approach that I'm proposing. OK, so problem two, expertise. And this is where a, a different critic might come in who wants to defend the um, psychiatrists and, and, and uh, doctors and so forth um, having this partial democracy and say, no, we shouldn't radically expand it, it's good how it is. And I think someone who wants to defend this position might say, well, the scientists who determine whether Pluto was a planet had relevant expertise, right? We shouldn't just let anyone vote on whether Pluto was a planet, right? The people who were allowed to vote had relevant expertise, and that's why, that's why they were allowed to. And they, they might say, well, similarly, doctors are experts in medicine, and you know, other relevant research and so forth. So they should decide what counts as illness. Patients, they might say, don't have the appropriate expertise. Um, again, I think this probably relies on an implicit commitment to naturalism 
um, which I've already said I find unconvincing. If it really was the case that illness or pathology was only evolutionary dysfunction, then perhaps we should just go and ask the evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary biologists and doctors exactly what we should count. But as I said, I don't think that's a good theory. There are too many problems with it. And of course, doctors are experts in very relevant things, most notably how to diagnose and treat disease or illness. And these are, of course, scientifically based practices. But I don't think that means they're experts in determining what should count as disease, which, as we've said, is a social and normative practice. Um, so I'm not, it's not clear to me that their expertise actually extends to that. I don't, I'm not, I think they have relevant expertise and should have some say, but not uh, total say. Okay. And very relevant here, I think, is standpoint epistemology, right? So the idea that marginalized groups, uh, well, everyone has a kind of standpoint and certain biases and stuff like that, um, but very importantly, members of marginalized groups will have more insight into their own social positioning. And I think that's particularly relevant given that dis you know, disabled people um, are, do form a marginalized group and more specific marginalized groups, um, which gives us some reason to think that there's relevant expertise in determining their own health status. Uh, for instance, autistic people will be better placed to know whether autism is an illness for them than people who are non-autistic. I think there's good reasons to think that there is relevant expertise there um, and that you don't, for instance, have to just be a doctor or evolutionary biologist or so forth. Um, okay, so I think this is final problem and just coming towards the end. Um, a problem could be if we say do, uh, a worry might be if we do, if you know, if I convince people and you say, okay, let's have a democratic approach to health, what if then people vote the wrong way? And I'll give uh, some examples to hypothetical examples to say what I mean by this. Um, so in the 1970s, when queerness was depathologized, many queer people did still see it as a pathology, and so did many, uh, many other people. Right. So even it was depathologized because lots of queer people actually were protesting the American Psychiatric Association's events and stuff like that. But they were activists and they had like what, what were then more, more radical views of the time. But lots of people did still think it was a pathology. And if we imagine just hypothetically, what if we had a complete democratic approach to health then? And we had said, you know, so queer people just got to vote on whether they wanted to depathologize. Um, but it's at least a possibility in that situation that if that had happened, um, that they might, as a, as a whole, still have voted to include it as an illness. Now, I don't think that probably would have happened, but it's a possibility. So that's the worry. Um, and to us today, that looks like, a, you know, voting the wrong way, as it were. Um, it, I think, you know, m many of us would think that would be an error. Um, so a worry with the democratic approach is that um, there might be various reasons, you could call it like internalized homophobia or, or, or some or things like that, where people could um, vote in a way which turns out to be really harmful. Um, so my, my response to this problem is, I acknowledge it's a worry, I acknowledge it's a possibility. Um, and I totally think a democratic approach won't just completely solve all the problems. Um, but I guess ultimately, um, I think it's better to let people choose. And as I've said, there are good reasons to think that people have more expertise um, in, in their own lives, right? The standpoint of epistemology approach. So in general, I think it's better to let people choose. I think it's better to empower marginalized people to determine whether they consider themselves um, healthy or pathological um, than to just let a small group of people decide who are, who are, who are doctors or whatever else. Um, and problem three continued, you can think of uh, another example, which was, was quite potentially worrying. Um, so since the 70s as well, some paedophile advocacy organizations have argued that they should be seen as a marginalized group rather than having an illness. And I think there's pretty obvious good reasons to be wary of this kind of argument. Um, 
in favour of switching from uh, paedophilia as mental illness to marginalised group. Well, I just want to caveat that I'm, it's not a debate I've looked into in great detail, so I'm, I'm literally just going with my with my kind of you know gut reaction on that. I I think there are pretty good reasons to be wary of that. Um, but the thought here is that if it turns out my gut reaction is right there, would a democratic approach risk empowering group, empowering groups with potentially harmful views, right, which could which could end up being harmful in various ways? Um, so that's a worry. And I guess I just want to say, well, it's a risk, but you know, there, there are loads of tools you can have. There are democratic mechanisms you can put in place to deal with rare issues, right? Um, right, so, so, so you can, there, there are fair, all sorts of tools you could use to, to have in place for if you know, there, was a, there was a very controversial case like this. So I, so I don't think there's necessarily um, a, a, a huge risk there. Um, so those are the, the key problems. Okay. So to summarize, as I said at the beginning, this is a very like, I just want to put this idea out there and see what people think and get some feedback. It's, it is really preliminary. But what I've said is, I think the existing naturalist accounts on the one hand and normativist theories on the other encountered more or less the same issues. Uh, right, so they both would end up justifying wrongful pathologization, wrongful depathologization. Um, and I've suggested that a democratic approach may have some benefits. Right, it might be empowering. It might have uh, allow us to allow us to include more expertise from standpoint epistemology and so forth, and help minimize the risks of these issues. I've also said that exactly which democratic approach and mechanisms we could use needs to be explored and that's something I haven't developed well worked out views on yet um, and I also just want to say a limitation of this approach I, I and to, to, to make sure I'm not misunderstood here um, I'm not saying this would be easy or that it would solve all the problems um, I think democracy is very hard it requires constant work democracy is imperfect and we shouldn't expect anything to be easy um, it requires ongoing work all the time. And I just want to leave with um, a, a quote I wrote in this, which I think summarizes my hopes here quite well. So this is just from a, um, a, a brief blog post I wrote a few months ago. For me, escaping the trap of the single story with regards to health requires centering the voices of neurodivergent and mad people in the continued critique, construction and reconstruction of the boundaries of health it requires recognizing that these boundaries never are or could be finished. They are always in flux and may differ from person to person. It also requires recognizing that they can only be negotiated by deliberative, messy and complex democratic processes. And it equally requires attempting to booby trap our deliberative processes so that they neither reflect existing inequalities in our power structures nor challenge them only to impose a new single story. Um, so that's my, my proposal. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you all think. So thank you very much. Okay, hi. Um, so we've got lots of hands, but I don't know if we've got Robert. So I'll wait for Robert to come back and then. Um, Elena, I think I'm going to start, I hope I said your name right, I'll start with you and I'll mute you just in a minute when Robert comes back. Ah, hello. Hi, I'm Hi. Hi. Um, great. So we have lots of questions, which is fantastic. We also had a series of comments throughout the uh, your talk in the chat box. Um, uh, so Elena was offering uh, various examples. Um, thinking about menopausal women, thinking about senile dementia as she was going through. And I think you have your hand raised, so maybe Elena, you can summarize some of your comments. I do have to say, I was thinking about the weeds, that there are some weeds that are invasive species. So there does seem to be something that's um, potentially not just about us deciding that they're bad. Um, but let me hand over to you, Elena. I think I've asked to unmute you. Has it worked? 
Yes, ah, thank you. Hi, I just want to say uh, this is does not happen often. There are two people with the same spelling of my name here. So those comments are should not be attributed to me. Um, I don't want to steal credit away, uh, but I pronounce it Elena. Uh, hi. So thank you, Robert. That was very, very interesting. Um, and I guess I have a, have you thought of this type of comment as opposed to like a question, I guess. Uh, but to clarify, I come at it from a feminist philosophy of disability, crypt theory, disability justice angle. And so I am very sympathetic to your project as someone who is not also satisfied with naturalized definitions of health and disability, etc. However, I am skeptical about democracy as a tool. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you define it? What would you mean by this expanded democratic process, which is not just narrow biomedical experts? Because I'm concerned that it's still operating within neoliberal ideas of rationality and rational autonomy and free will that if it's not taken with ideas like solidarity or with a special attention to like the logic of affects is likely to reproduce the kind of democracy that we see an active right now in parliament. Um, so I guess my question is the clarification question about what do you mean by this expanded view of democratic process? Thank you, that, that's a yeah, really, um, really important points and um, important question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, <laughs> I, I'm kind of skeptical of democracy uh, it, it, for, for similar reasons, uh, in the sense that, you know, obviously democracy can just be really bad and it depends how people approach it, right? So if we think of democracy just as something where people go and vote once a year or something like that, but without really engaging in any, any other way, then that's often um, can, can, can like be, be quite unhelpful. You can just end up with two choices who are exactly the same anyway and stuff like that. Um, I guess I think of democracy more as an active process where, which will include things like protest, things like activism and stuff like that. Um, and which, where we see this as a normal part of the process of normal, you know, normal part of the process of, of determining health uh, and the boundaries of health or health status. Um, so we don't see this as a kind of infr like infringement upon the proper scientific process of determining what health is, but rather part of Part of how it should be done so i mean going back to there are actually quite a lot again i something i touched on i i think we just already do this to some extent but it's seen as an aberration from what we should be doing right so for instance gay people protesting the ap american psychiatric association in the 1970s to argue that you know to, to argue for the depathologization of queerness um that was seen as a kind of um I mean, lot, lots of people agree with it now, right? But uh, like, it was seen as a not a not part of a standard process, but a kind of an, an activist thing, right? Rather than a proper scientific thing. And I just want to say we should see that as part of the process. It's a completely legitimate part of the process. It should be standard. Um, I also think there are loads of other examples, ongoing ones. Um, in fact, in an interesting example is the expansion of autism in the last DSM, right? It's into the broad spectrum construct. Now, there are still loads of problems with this. Um, there are always going to be problems with these constructs. But one important thing about that was, was that actually autistic activists had a fair amount of input into it. Um, the Autistic Staff Advocacy Organization did some really, um, I think, just really clever and successful lobbying and actually had quite a lot of input into that alongside psychiatrists and so forth. Um, there's a really good paper on this by uh, Ari Neyman and Stephen Kapp, who, who, who um, have written about their experience of, of, of that lobbying and, and, and so forth. But too many uh, other people, too many naturalists, they said, actually, this is, they, they said, now we've got this broad concept of autism, which doesn't map onto natural pathology at all, and there's nothing, it's unscientific. And they were like, this is bad. But I want to say that actually that process was 
you know, that's what we should be doing. That should just be seen as part of the normal process. So I guess my, my understanding of democracy is of not, it's not just about voting. It's about, um, it's about seeing these concepts as always contestable um, in that sense. Um, as for it, the risk of it just kind of reproducing neoliberal logics, yeah, I think that's a risk. Um, I, I mean, again, um, that's, that's a kind of risk with everything under, <laughs> under neoliberalism. So I, I, I guess I don't think the, I don't think that's a problem for, for my proposal more than it is for literally any anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, does, does that answer your questions or? No, absolutely. I guess it was more, I'm not saying this option is better or worse than managing that. I'm just, I was just curious, had you thought about how would you go about um, taking those issues into account? The, the fact that, for example, um, eugenics and in medicine have an have been associated and continue to be associated with uh, economic costs of like expensive lives and things like that. So it's just, I I'm, I don't expect you to have like a firm answer, but it was just kind of this idea like, okay, if we're democratizing this, how do we account for the fact that we have inertia in lots of our systems about certain inequities? Yeah. Good, yeah, I mean, I guess this was, I mean, one, one thing is, I, I mean, I don't think there's only so much you can expect from an approach to health, in a, like a theoretical and practical approach to defining the boundaries of health to, to deal with those problems. And I, but um, I, something I mentioned in the talk did touch on this, well, is relevant to this. And when I said it would be epistemically useful to, and I only covered this very briefly, when I said it would be epistemically useful to reframe health as something um, that we can decide by, should should be deciding just by democratic processes. Um, I think that would probably help politicize health. Um, I mean, it, it could go wrong. It could, could be, could, you know, just not, not politicize health, but I think that would help. It would help change how people interact with, with these kinds of things and how people lobby and how people, um, all those kinds of things. So that, that's my hope there. Change how we think about them in a way which would allow us to change how we act. But I mean, that, that's my hope. I don't really, I can't, I can't really give that much um, evidence for, for it. That's, that's just, that's, that's the thought though. Great, thank you. And Elena, sorry that I confused you with the other Elena. I too have never seen two people with your spelling of a name on a Zoom, so I got confused, but thank you for the clarification. Um, so I'm just gonna, so we've got a question from Sam Fellows, Helen Scott Fordsman, Bennett Knox and one in the room. I think just to go in order, Sam will come to you, then Helen, then question in the room, and Bennett. Um, so Helen, I should be able to un... Uh, Sam, sorry, I should... Oh, you're unmuted? Yeah, great. No, oh, unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, thank you for the talk. I mean, I, I think I largely agree with you, but um, just a, a potential worry, which um, I suppose my question is, do you think this will happen and be is it actually a concern? So it relates to the idea that people forming a group who decide on whether something is pathological or not, let's say all autistic people, if they come together to decide what's pathological, different members of that group will take the democratic process more seriously than others. So perhaps as an analogous example, I think I've noticed, this is just some looking online, that people who are pro-neurodiversity Autistic people who are pro-neurodiversity are much more likely to like service user involvement. And that kind of makes sense because they sort of say, hey, uh, psychiatrists have had a bad notion or uh, flaws in their notion of autism. And so we need to get more people who are not psychologists. Let's get people who are actually autistic to be involved in research. OK, fair enough. In contrast, anti-neurodiversity people are typically like, well, wait a minute. Um, the psychiatrists are, are broadly right, and by trying to depathologize autistic, you're actually introducing non-autistic people into, the, into um, the debate, and so you might have non-autistic people actually being consulted under the assumption they're autistic. So in that regard, um, to, to my mind, if we want to make service user involvement truly representative, we'd actually have to involve people 
who dislike service user representation within psychiatric research. Now, there might be good theoretical reasons not to actually include such people, that's debatable, but the same problem could occur here. If you are a neuro neurodiversity supporter, then it seems to me you're going to say, yes, we need democracy to decide if autism is pathologized or not. Whereas if you're anti-neurodiversity, then you're probably going to say, well, wait a minute, we already know it's not pathologized because we trust, like, we've got good reasons to trust psychiatrists. So it seems to me there's a, I suppose there's a danger that when you try and form your group, their views on um, the nature of the, 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 the condition in the first place might then influence how, they in, how, how seriously they take the democratic process. So A, do you think that could happen? And B, do you think that's a potential problem? Sorry for that long-windedness. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a, it's a really important question. And, and it's a, I mean, it's a good example as well. Um, I guess I, I recognize it could be a problem, um, but I think it's already a problem, right? So people, as, as I, I mean, when I say it's a problem, it already, this already happens. Um, so for example, the, as I, well, as, as I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it was already the case that um, autistic groups lobbied to have the diagnosis changed in various ways and they were very successful and they were pro neurodiversity people um so people can already do that and that will be the people who are more politically active and engaged and stuff like that um i just think that it should be more standard to allow that rather than having to get people you know to to form these like organizations and stuff just to to have a say um so i'm not sure I don't think it would be more of a problem because I think that already happens um, if you do see it as a problem, right? So, I mean, I, I, I think, by the way, just I, I think the autistic input into the DSM-5 was helpful and good. But if you're someone who is worried about that, then, you know, I'll, I'll just say, well, that already happens anyway. Um, it, just, it just happens by people still managing to do it despite us not having enough mechanisms to do it. Um, so... so Another thing is, I think, I mean, something I mentioned in the talk is that if we do this with the kind of boundaries of our health concepts, it might follow that we should do it with other things as well, right? So perhaps the boundaries of diagnoses and how we divide them or subdivide them and those kinds of things. So if you ended up with uh, people really divided, um, so um, you could end up perhaps splitting the diagnosis right into the or the you know the splitting the kind into into maybe a pathological kind and a non-pathological kind and stuff like that again that would be you would have to go through a sort of d deliberative messy long democratic processes to do that um i guess yeah so i i mean i i do acknowledge these can be worries i just I don't think they're as bad as what we have already. And I think we already have these problems. I just think there would be more chance for more, um, more people with, with their standpoints to, to, to have a say basically, um, or with relevant standpoints. Um, does that answer your question or have yes, I? Yes, that's all good. Thank um, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a really well worked out view on this, but um, that's, that's my initial thought. Great, thank you. And we have a um, uh, comment from other Lena on the chat uh, saying Sam puts his finger on the problem of the hard to reach patients whose views cannot be reached. Do you discount them because it is too difficult to involve them or do you then ignore the rest because you pursue these hard to reach people given funds are limited? So I think Elena meant that as a finger potentially on Sam's question. I don't know if you want to address that quickly, Robert, and then we'll go on to Helen's question. Thanks. So yeah, so I think so I think that's a I mean that's an important point. Yeah. Um no, and no, certainly I guess my I guess my view is that at the moment people, as you say, pa patients whose views cannot be reached precisely aren't heard at the moment. At the moment, people do lobby already, people do things. And often it's you know, people who have more power in some sense, you know, people who are more, you know, however you want to put it, privileged, middle class, have got more of a, you know, whoever have got more influence tend to be able to lobby at the moment. Um, the, the idea of a democratic approach is, is precisely, in my view, supposed to, supposed to broaden that to, to allow more people who don't, you know, I mean, lots of people don't have the time to lobby, don't have the resources, don't have the money, don't have all that kind of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, as, as to exactly how you would do that, 
Um, I mean, that's that's the I haven't got that far working on this yet to, to say much about that. But the point would be precisely to reach people that you don't don't currently hear. Um, as to people whose views, I mean, um, cannot be reached. I mean, there's no democracy again isn't perfect, right? Um, there are, you know, it's always going to leave some people out. I think you can sort of do the best you can to try and expand it, um, but it's there's never been a perfect democracy, and there's never going to be. Um, so, but um, yeah, so I hope, I hope that answers that worry. And thank you. Great, thanks, Robert. Um, over to Helen, whose name I recognise I might not be pronouncing correctly, but please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> No worries. It's I respond to any sort of pronunciation of the name. Um, so I have more of a suggestion, actually. So you uh, asked for suggestions on sort of thinking about the democratic aspects of this process. And I don't know whether so as I, if I understood you correctly, you're not looking to sort of do like a nationwide vote. You're looking to include the groups that are actually relevant in these uh, different uh, debates. And I wanted to mention this book. I'm sure you already know it. Uh, it's mm. Miriam Solomon writing on uh, medical, making medical knowledge. And she talks a lot about these consensus conferences. And um, so the way that you talked about consensus conferences, you refer mainly to, to what she categorizes as technical consensus conferences. But she also mentions a different model, which is the Scandinavian model uh, of consensus, which she calls interface consensus conferences and these are actually specifically designed to involve all relevant parties and usually they would involve patient groups uh, sometimes uh, also if there are different group patient uh, groups of patients that disagree with each other all the groups would be heard uh, so that might be one thing to uh, think about and look into uh, then I was thinking a bit about it and I thought this there's one issue with with this model which um, perhaps relates a bit to Sam, Sam's question. And, and, and I think it trans, trans sort of transfers into your, uh, uh, your suggestion is that in order to have a patient group, you need to already have the, the category, the pathological category. So you won't have patient groups for things that are not yet pathologized and for the patient groups of things that are pathologized, but you would like to depathologize the people who strongly disagree with the pathologization might not be in the patient or like they might not um, identify with with the groups that were supposed to represent them in this uh, dialogue so you have this issue of uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can call it like a, a chicken or an egg situation where you want people defined by the patho pathological categories to have a say in defining the pathological categories um, but yeah, so what comes first uh, in that sort of debate? Um, thanks, yeah, re really, um, thank you for the suggestion. And, and yeah, good, several really important points there. Um, so firstly, yeah, the, the different kinds of consensus conferences you've mentioned. Um, I think this touches on something I was tr trying to sort of say in the talk is that Basically, I, I think we already have a democratic approach to health, right? So it's not, it's not, um, it's something that's already happening. And our concepts of our theory, but theoretical debates about the nature of health are just like behind this and they need to catch up. So that that was the kind of um, a, an, another example of the kind of thing I have in mind. Um, um, but rather than these kind of working against these theories that we should just say, you know, um, that's just what health is um right so yeah um with regard to so yeah the patient groups i mean i don't have any yeah who, who would count in the group I mean, I, I just don't see any reason you can't have relevant stakeholders without, so there can be relevant stakeholders who are, you know, who don't count in the group, right? So an example would be like, you know, lots of, I don't know, in, in 
uh, an example which has been mentioned a few times already, like autism debates about all the, all the debates about autism, uh, a, a really relevant stakeholder for autism because it's a de developmental disability are the parents of autistic children. Um, so so you, you can have all sorts of room for people who are adjacent to a diagnosis in various ways without them having a diagnosis or qualifying for it. Um, I, I don't have any really, I mean, my, my next, the, the next um, part of this project for me would be to delve into democratic theory a lot and find, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know this well enough yet to, to say, but there's, I mean, I know there's loads of literature on representation of minorities within democracy and how, you know, the best way to, best ways to do this basically. Um, and I just need to review all that and to, I want to review all that and, I mean, that'll take ages, but, um, and then try to map on which, which works best. Um, but um, does that answer, or do you have any more suggestions? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know all this literature, so I'm sure that there will be solutions there. I think there's, there's definitely, um, yeah, I don't think it solves the problem to say that, well, parents can also be involved because you still need the adjacency to the actual pathological um, diagnoses, right? Um, so, so, yeah, but but I'm sure that there's yeah. the democratic theory so, that will help. I guess, um, so, so something which is not yet recognized. I guess you, you have like, I mean, I think you still, you see stuff like this as well, right? So you get new, new things emerging. So a, a recent new one, like long COVID, this is a, a very new thing. It's only existed in the last couple of years. Um, and there are, there are lots of people campaigning in various ways to have it recognized. And I mean, it is recognized now, but it's maybe not recognized enough and so forth. Um, and, you know, if we just had more, more mechanisms for people to have had it recognized more quickly, we might now have a lot less people with long COVID or suffering so badly in, in the various ways ways they do, um, I guess. But but you could have, I mean, I don't see why you can't have mechanisms where people can lobby and apply for new, like new recogni recognition of new things, for example. Um, I, again, I don't have any like well-worked <laughs> response there. I just, I just don't see any reason it couldn't be possible. So it, yeah. But that's that's as far as, as as I could say at the moment. But thank thank you. That's a it's really important. I need to think more on it. Um, thanks. Um, I was I have making medical knowledge in my bag, and I was thinking about the consensus committees. And I also had a similar question to you, Helen. So thank you for asking that. Uh, birds and stones. Um, I think Nick has a question. Uh, who's going to sit here? Hi, Robert. Thanks. That was really great. Um, I hope I'm not going to self-parody too much as an analytic philosopher by trying to draw a distinction between distinctions. Um, but uh, anyway, here goes. So there's, a there, there's one distinction, which is that between normativism and naturalism, which you spoke about a lot. There's another distinction between a sort of objective view and a subjective view. And these things often get bundled together, but in fact, I think they should be kept distinct, in particular because um, to have a, normative, a normativist view of health um, doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a view of health where it's determined by more rule, because it might be determined by normative facts, and people can be wrong about mm -hmm. those things. Um, it seems as though mob rule as a problem was kind of a large part in the motivation field view, so I just wanted to hear what you think about um, instead seeing a kind of a normativist view on which um, to say that, to say, yeah, that's basically it, where, where actually there are, people can be wrong about normative matters, so even if, even if the mob says that something is a disvalued state, that doesn't successfully pathologize it because they can simply be mistaken about that. Good, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I think I, I, I skipped some stuff that normativists often say, which um, is re which is relevant here. So, normativists tend to. I mean, there is this worry about what I what I called mob rule, um, but normativists, normativists what they tend to do is propose necessary and sufficient conditions for. For counting something as pathological um, to distinguish like what's a legitimate medical condition from it from their view from just another thing we disvalue for any any other reason right um, and there's loads of different theories like that and they 
you know, lots of people have suggested, you know, they'll suggest three necessary and sufficient conditions or so forth. Um, but so far for every one of them I've seen, there's, there's always counter examples, right? They would end up pathologizing something really strange, like getting a tattoo or, or um, you know, or, or, you know, there, there's always counter examples. Um, so I think that's still stuck in the trying to develop a theory of health mindset, which is different to, and when I say a theory of health, kind of some kind of idea of, well, one way of thinking of that might be precisely in terms of having like necessary and sufficient conditions of what counts or what should count, um, which is different from my approach. But yeah, there, there are much more nuanced normativist accounts, which, which have these really you know, intricately worked out um, proposals. Um, as for the values, yeah. Um, so I guess you could have like, a, you, I mean, in ethics, right, you have naturalist accounts of flourishing. Um, now, I think these run into the same problems. Um, in fact, I, I wrote a, a, a paper on this um, uh, last year or with a co-wrote a paper um, about how naturalist accounts often rely on a species norm, right, about what they count as good. And that ends up devaluing, I think, um, perhaps like a typical ways of thriving. Um, so I don't think that would get out of the problem um, there. I think they often encounter the same kind of problems that naturalist accounts of health encounter because they often rely on like a species norm notion of functioning. Um, but it kind of switches that for a species norm notion of flourishing, for example. Um, and especially with regards to the kinds of cases which end up being controversial in the, in the boundaries of health. Um, they're precisely people who tend to fall outside um, species, the species norm in some sense, in, the, in that kind of sense. So I'm, yeah, that's why I'm, that's why I didn't, that's why I didn't go down that route basically. Um, yeah. Um, Perhaps perhaps someone will have a response and can convince me at some point, but I, at the moment I, I don't see a, a good count, account of a kind of natural normativity in terms of thriving and flourishing rather than functioning that doesn't encounter the same problems. Um, does that does that answer the the worry for you? Thank thank you. No, plenty more to say, but yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, great. And uh, we have time, I think, for one more question. Bennett, whose hand's been up this whole time, um, and Robert, then I will just draw your attention after this question to the chat box where there's various comments, some thank you, some further research. But Bennett, I'll hand over to you. Oh, can't hear you. Yeah, you can try putting it in the chat. Quick type. Okay, <laughs> pull up the sleeves and go. Um, yeah, in the meantime, Robert, you, there's some other. Um, oh, one second. So yeah, in the meantime, I can just we can just look at some of the comments. Uh, there was lots of comments, some long, some short. What was a recent one? Um, Miri McFarlane says, agree that although there are issues, it's valuable to consider what is a novel issue and how these issues are mitigated or exacerbated. Secondly, I think wherever you take a norm to this approach, there's always an implicit impermanence to the outcomes, um, with the hope being that iterative engagement uh, with these issues leads to gradual improvement. And with that in mind, have you thought about social, cultural, political values and motivations, which are currently producing resistance to shifting boundaries of health illness? Um, yeah, so if if I've understood this correctly. Um, Sorry, think... can you hear me now? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, All right. Can I just say um, uh, one? Okay. Hold that thought because I think Robert was just going to quickly reply yeah. to a comment as we were kind of filling time, but I'll come back to you very shortly. So, Robert, yeah. Um, I think, 
I I think this relates to some. I mean, to some of the other questions. Um, social, cultural, and political values and motivations which are currently producing resistance to shifting the boundaries of health or illness. Um, I mean, I think there are so there are social, cultural, and political values and motivations which resist shifting the boundaries. Uh, there are also a whole bunch of similar motivations which uh, lead people to try to shift the boundaries in various ways. Um, I mean, I think these tend to reflect people's general politics in much more general ways. Um, you know, do, do people think that, um, you know, so uh, do people think that disability is something to be ashamed by, or ashamed of, for example, or something like that? They might think that's a reason to not call something a disability. Um, on the other hand, if someone thinks some, you know, you could have disability pride, um, like I'm, I'm someone who's has disability pride. I, I, I think it's okay to call things disability and stuff like that. Um, so often these motivations or, or or various kind of forces in each side relate to much more general, um, much more general politics. Also, just left and right as well. Um, you know, lots of people, not everyone, of course, but lots of people want to minimize recognition of certain health concepts for because they think everyone should just be a, a kind of individual and take responsibility for their for their individuality and stuff like that. And, and there are, are various disorder or disability concepts kind of stop people taking responsibility. Um, so you get people who want to kind of shrink the notion of pathology because they think it is a kind of um, broadening of a, of a kind of of a collectivist left wing kind of thing, which they which they see as bad, and so there are all sorts of reasons for wanting to shift the boundaries. Um, and I guess I think that a, a, a democratic approach would just help bring all that to light, um, rather than keep those sort of motivations and forces hidden. Um, and I think that's part of, again. What I, I said this only very briefly in the talk, but I think it could be epistemically useful. And that's that's I guess one of the reasons I, th I think all these things are happening anyway. Um, and I think it would help to make them more open to, because I think they're obscured at the moment to some extent. Um, so, I, so I guess it, I hope it could be useful in that way there. But thank you, that's the, I mean, it's, it's precisely something which is, is motivating this, this suggestion. Great, thanks Robert. And so we are over time, but I think one last question because we started five minutes late, so Bennett, now we should be able to hear you. Okay, yes, Great. can you hear me? All right. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I'm really excited you're working on this sort of stuff. This is like the sort of stuff that I'm trying to work on similarly. So I've got sort of a point towards the literature that will flow into a question, hopefully. And I think it's a good follow up to the the previous question uh, the, the, from the person in the room. Um, because so I've been thinking about this using the work of Quill Kukla, who has this like institu institutional definition of health, which I think fits that sort of bill of being a, it's like normativist, but it's like, we can still get things right or wrong because, you know, there are facts about norms or whatever. And you, you, you answered that well, but they have sort of a newer, a newer paper about the concept of disease and like what counts as a disease or not, where they sort of go just radically pluralist and prag pragmatic and say, there's just, there isn't going to be a unifying metaphysics of disease or of health. Like, and we shouldn't be focusing on trying to get that sort of account. It's going to be so, so pluralistic. And there's so many different, uh, you know, stakeholders with different values and different sort of interests that we, you know, we philosophers should, should not be aiming for this sort of like unifying metaphysical project. And so I wanted to ask whether you're on board with that sort of take or whether you think like, okay, maybe it's really complicated, but eventually we'll get some sort of unified philosophical metaphysics of like what health is or what disease is or whether we should just give up on that project. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yeah. So that's a, um, another really helpful suggestion. I haven't read this new paper. Um, so it sounds like I, I need to need to read it. Um, and so I can only go by what you've just said. Um, but that sounds like precisely something I'm on board with from what from what you've said. Um, and I guess like, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think you can ever have a like a final sort of metaphysics of health or anything like that. Um, I mean, there are certainly people who think you are, 
uh, or that you can, sorry, and, and some people who think that we have already had that, you know, and we've already got it, and we just need to work out the details um, or reply to criticisms, or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I just don't think that project is ever going to be finished. And I think it's, for me, it's it's not just that it's not ever going to be finished. It's that it's unhelpful to think of it as something that's is com com completable uh, or is possible to complete. Um, and I guess this pro this comes back to the um, thing I, I've mentioned about the epistemic usefulness of the democratic approach. I think it would help show that and help people think of health like that as something that is never is never complete or finished or or never could be. You, you could never have some right count, account or final account or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I, I need to I need I need to to read this. So, so thank you. I threw a link in the chat and I am, I agree. <laughs> um, that was a great question and reading suggestion to end uh, our first event in the colloquium series on new concepts of health and disease. Uh, so to say, you know, maybe it's a failed project in the first place. Uh, it's a nice way to end. So thank you very much, Bennett, for your question. And Robert, thank you so much for uh, your talk and a great Q&A. It's been really nice having you. Um, and so I don't know if anyone... <laughs> Can hear the three of us clapping in the room and hopefully some online. Um, hopefully we'll see some of you either in person or online at our next event on November 10th and then the subsequent events after you'll be able to find information on our website. Um, have a lovely evening and thanks for coming. <laughs>